a security consultant on the show, Dr. Steve Okori. Good morning to you, Dr. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you for inviting me. Now, very quickly, before we get into some sad news on the story, uh, let's start with the good news. And in terms of the good news, it's with the call on the National Assembly to look into the welfare of soldiers in Nigeria. Now, whilst the Defence Headquarters has also made intimations captured by the leadership newspaper that their salaries would be reviewed upwards, it is in line with the current cost of living issues. Now, let's just look at that for perspective. Now, on the leadership this morning, you see uh, beneath the lead story, the infographics with a soldier armed to the tooth, the story, cost of living crisis, CSOs, experts, demand pay raise for soldiers. NAS may intervene, says Senate spokesperson. FG already working on it, says Defense Headquarters. Now, whilst the sal salary of some soldiers are 52,000 Naira to 57,000 Naira, it is also the hazard, occupational hazard they face. It's one of those concerns when people hear that some of our soldiers are paid 52,000 Naira. I know the entry point also has uh, some connotations to where their, their salary is ranked, mm. but the challenge is on their occupational hazard. 52,000 Naira for a soldier, some of them in the war front. Uh, this calls on the National Assembly. Defense Headquarters is saying it's going to do something about it. Should we even be having this news make the front page of newspapers before being attended to? At all. <laughs> I mean, uh, these are stories that we should not even hear. How do you expect them to have that uh, commitment? You know, uh, you expect them to be patriotic in uh, delivering what they've been constitutionally saddled with to do. Um, how do you now begin to look at it that you are talking about 52,000 naira, 57,000 naira for a soldier that is in the war front? Nigeria is not in a very, Nigeria is in a, in a bad state, I must say, considering the insecurity situation in the country, Boko Haram, kidnappers, bandits, and all that. And you see how they ambush them everywhere. Uh, the recent one, of course, you know. So how do you now get that commitment from them? I think they have paid the supreme price long, too long, and uh, talking about salaries for them is long overdue. It's not something that uh, the government should uh, treat with uh, kid gloves. Yes, uh, I think they deserve the best, if you ask me, because when you begin to look at um, what civil servants do in their offices and they are asking for that kind of amount of money to be as minimum wage, then you begin to look at what the soldiers also do. Uh, which, of course, when you begin to look at it comparatively, uh, they, they, they face a lot of uh, violent attacks, you know, f from uh, perceived criminal elements or non-state actors. And uh, you need to see that you boost their morale, you know, by incrementing their remuneration. Better their welfare. Better analysis. welfare, yes, their DTAs and all that. It's not something that the, the government should uh, take for granted. Now, let's look at some of the infographic highlights this morning on what the soldiers who end between the brackets of 52 to 57,000 Naira have to do to survive in the interim. We're told that this is likely one of the reasons why you find soldiers engaging in petty trade. Certainly. You, the other infographics okay. here says uh, some of these soldiers are forced into exploitation. They exploit citizens at checkpoints. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one here now says soldiers are forced into corruption. Well, th these are quite uh, prominent issues we see. The last time a, a video went viral, uh, which also cost the soldier his job. He had to be dismissed because he was complaining that his take-home could not cater for his transport. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, the soldiers or the hierarchy of the military should commend that soldier for coming out to, to voice out rather than dismissing um, such, a, such a personnel. Uh, we are in a democracy, so there should be at least some level of uh, freedom of uh, expression. The soldier has come out to express himself that what he takes home is not enough to cater for him and his family. Rather than uh, dismissing the soldier, it's just to uh, see how to talk to him and uh, pacify. They need to be pacified, you know, because the sacrifices that they put is not commensurate to the amount of money that they are being paid, you know. Uh, tomorrow you hear that a whole lot of them are dying that Nigerians don't even know, you know. They kill them in the, in the forests when they go to 
face or confront these uh, bandits and other criminal elements. You know, so I think that uh, because of uh, the meager amount of money that they collect, because and uh, because they are now uh, prone to uh, the civilian population where they uh, because the police are overwhelmed, they now <coughs> have roadblocks. They begin to capitalize on uh, on uh, how to see how to make ends meet from there. You know, they, there's a way they do it. They tactically take these uh, monies from motorists in a stylish way. It's not the way the police does. You know, I've I've, I've, I've confronted them before. When uh, you approach checkpoint, they tell you to go and park at that point where they check. You know, and they come in a very um, Subtle. Subtle manner and all that and approach. And I don't see that as uh, bribe because the way they approach you, you, you also want to have a... You need to tip them. Yes, too. pity on them because you see how they, the sacrifice that they are putting and all that. At the end of the day, you just okay, take this for something, something, you know. But the fact of the matter is that if they are well paid, you know, they will do their job professionally because we know our Nigerian soldiers, our military to be very professional in their dealings. So the government needs to see how to take care of that because they deserve it. Now, as we look past the leadership newspaper to our main focus of the day, it is off the back of a sad incident that happened over the course of the weekend in Lokogoma Estate in Abuja, where a retired Army Brigadier General, Arnold Uwem Udokwere, lost his life in a confrontation with armed robbers at his residence. Now, this issue has made the rounds and it is quite uh, disheartening when you also look at the publication making the round. You'd also find that having been covered on the Punch newspaper with a splash story, armed robbers killed retired general in Abuja. And there you find the picture of the demised retired member of the Nigerian Armed Forces, Brigadier General Uwem Harnold Udoke retired. Uh, it's quite sad. Uh, we've also seen the statements coming in from uh, the police public relations officer in the FCT, SP Josefina Day, who said that uh, the, the general retired died a brave death combating this said armed robbers in his residence. And the police commissioner, Bennett Igwe, has expressed profound sorrow over the loss, extending condolence to his family. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a situation where it breaks my heart that in an estate, uh, these issues could happen and it almost feels like he was targeted. Yes, you see, it has happened. The life of the general is gone, right? Now, the police, uh, they are sending their condolences and their sympathy to the family of uh, the retired general that was killed. It's unfortunate that the man is dead, and that life cannot be brought back. Now, what, what are we saying here? The police, one of their mandates is prime, crime prevention. How well are they preventing this crime from happening? I think the best, one of the key uh, methods of seeing that crime don't happen is by preventing it. If that uh, uh, robbery attack was prevented, Forstalled. yes, the man wouldn't have died. And I followed the story, and um, it wasn't the first time robbers were gaining entrance into his house. This, one of the times they came, they said that they stole his generator and some other personal uh, uh, belongings. Now. It's an estate in Lokogoma, and um, the estate, I heard that they provided security just around the entrance. When you have... Where private you, security, we must note. Yes, private security. Now, we need to see how to reinforce this private security, because uh, at the situation we are now, we, we cannot completely rely on the government to provide, provide our security. That's where we, the citizens, need to see that uh, we provide our own security, you know, by indulging some youths that would think that can uh, parade, go on patrol within the estate. Come on, these estates are found in the, the suburbs. suburbs, and you cannot find presence of security, you know, the police and all that. I, I recall uh, I interviewed a kidnapped victim where he said uh, when the kidnappers came to his residence, he couldn't get access to the police. What he could get access to was the vigilante group, you know, that he had to call on his phone. When they came, they were overpowered by the kidnappers because of the kind of arms and ammunition they came with, you know. So what am I saying here? 
we have to go about seeing how to provide our own security, you know, because uh, if we don't do that, we are at uh, our own peril because uh, the police, they are not ghosts uh, to be found everywhere. And of course, we don't have enough number. Now, now doctor, this is one of the premise on which uh, an honorable member of the Senate, mm. Senator Ned Woko, yes. was looking to raise the motion to allow Nigerians to carry up light arms. And people said, uh, it's become a menace in other countries where you have young school children go to school and take arms of their parents and kill people. Mm. But in providing security for ourselves as a people, yes. uh, is it through intelligence gathering, community watch, like you said, through vigilante? What are some of the practical ways that Nigerians can be our own security whilst we, we, we hope for the best? Now, um, of course, bearing arms in Nigeria is not the way to go. We have our laws that is against that. Uh, in the US, of course, we are aware that uh, once you are 20, 21, 18, depending on the state, you are legally entitled to an arm. You can walk into a shop and get it. But here in Nigeria, we don't have that law. Now, what I think is that uh, by providing our own security is to see how to hire the services of some everybody dudes, you know. This, they cannot bear arms. Of course, you know that the law is against the individuals or group of people bearing arms. Now, it's about information gathering at that point. Information gathering, when they see something, you try to pass the information to uh, the law enforcement agencies. Now, it was that information that you pass to the law enforcement agencies is when it is processed. It is collected, 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 analyzed, evaluated, looked at it to see at that point it now being processed, it becomes an intelligence, you know. So intelligence is first of all an information, you know. So when it's being processed through the processes, how it now, the, the agencies of government, security agencies will now see that, okay, this is truly an information that they really need to act on. I will have seen a situation where uh, a, a, a village in somewhere in Ibarapa, Ibarapa North local government in Oyo State, where the community got an information that they were going to be attacked by headsmen, you know, and they passed the information to security agencies. At that point, we expect the security agencies to process that information to become an intelligence, you know, meaning that they have ascertained that certain attacks was going to be carried out on the, that very community. But the security agencies did not act on it. At the end of the day, the community was attacked. This was in 2021 or 2022, there about about 20 persons were killed. So getting that information and passing it to the law enforcement agencies is one thing. And the law enforcement agencies processing it to become an intelligence is another thing. And once it becomes an intelligence, there's need for our law enforcement agencies to see how to share the intelligence amongst the other security agencies, you know, so that they can see how to foster uh, at such attacks from happening. But do we have that synergy amongst our security agencies where intelligence shared can be uh, managed and to see that uh, these things don't happen. Now, in uh, crime investigation, you need what we call uh, uh, intelligence gathering and also surveillance. These two key methods of uh, trying to see how to prevent uh, crimes from happening, right? Once you do that, crimes don't happen. It, it also helps in seeing that the crime that has already happened can be investigated, you know. Now, do we have that amongst our security agencies, do they gather that intelligence? Do they carry our surveillance amongst themselves to see that these crimes don't happen? These are the key questions we need to ask. So supposing that information got to the police right on time and it was processed that this uh, estate usually have attacks and robbers coming and all that, they would have seen how to provide security. But the worst of it is that we don't even have enough uh, police officers on ground. You know, I was coming here, I saw videos of uh, celebrities and you see the kind of police following them and the other citizens are just left because they don't have uh, the way with that to hire the services of police for their protection. So there's a whole lot that the government needs to do, you know, and uh, for almost two, three years now, we'll be hearing about recruitment of 10,000 police officers, constables. How long will it take us to do that? And that's another challenge because we've also seen the, uh, what do you call it, disagreement between the Nigerian police force and the police service commission on that said recruitment. And up until now, only 20,000 from a projected 60,000 have been recruited. Have they even gone into going for training and all that? And you know, big question. Oh, and you come and see, the police say that uh, there was corruption in that uh, recruitment exercise. The 
police service commission came out to say there was nothing like that. They were they were even asking for the IGP to resign. And so why do we begin to have those conflicting information from the police, from the hierarchy of the police, and from the police service commission? At least they are same body. What I mean, same body. They should be working. As, yes, as one. So why that uh, conflict information? This is way this, this one will say the other. You know, I don't think it's healthy for our current situation in the country. Now, this incident in Abuja is one that has brought quite sadness to the hearts of many, especially since it was carried out in an estate. Now, the need for private security and vigilante through the community watch approach has been highlighted. But more so, away from Abuja, and now to an incident in Lagos, is a debate of whether some of these incidences are underreported or is it because it is in prominent cities that they make the front page of dailies. Now, in broad daylight in Lagos, this next story has elicited outrage from onlookers who witnessed the murder of a young man in broad daylight. The Daily Sun of the 23rd of June 2024 has that feature story. Lagos outrage as Okada riders repeatedly run over, kill task force officer. Lagos outrage as Okada riders repeatedly run over, kill task force officer. Now, now, Doctor, this is another disturbing one. In broad daylight, minors were watching. It almost felt as though we were watching a Mexican film where cartels just unleash mayhem in public and nothing is done. Where were the security forces? Where was the NSCDC? Uh, we know we talk about the police quite often, but the NSCDC uh, should have been deployed in that area of Lagos. The man was killed. The tax force officer was killed. The bike men who plied that road repeatedly ran a train over him. <laughs> Um, what a barbaric uh, situation. You see, uh, to respond to this, I want to take us to the crime triangle. The tri in the crime triangle, you have the desire. The desire, then you have the opportunity, then you have the reward, right? Now, when somebody intends to go into a crime or commit a crime, that's the desire is within the person. He wishes to do that. It's not for the law enforcement agent to know that such a person wants to commit such a crime. Now, what the law enforcement agent need to do now is that the person does not have the opportunity to commit that crime. And uh, the person does not, at the end of the day, get a reward for it. Now, the Okada, the Okada rider that did that, lost the feeling, the desire to go in to do that, to commit that. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done he that. He got accomplices, uh, accomplices as well. At the end of the day. Now, the opportunity now for the Okada man not to have a embarked on that was for the law enforcement to not for not for the person not to have the opportunity if they were on ground there the Okada rider wouldn't have had gotten the opportunity to ride over the the officer that was killed in that manner now the Okada rider now has gone with the reward that he has achieved whatever he wanted to achieve by running over the person and killing the person as well so i think the presence of security agents needs to be visible you know it needs to be visible and i keep saying it we don't have enough of these men on ground there's need for government to recruit more and more we cannot have less 400,000 police officers in a country as big as nigeria with over 200 million population we need the presence of security agents on ground they, they need to be visible you know to see that they are doing the tax that they are saddled with when they are when you expect them to perform it's not possible so uh, we, we keep talking about these issues, these are the problems, these are the challenges and all that. What effort is the government doing to see that these challenges are, are handled? These are the questions. I keep saying it that we already know the problem. We know the issues bedeviling Nigeria in the area of insecurity. People talk about uh, food scarcity, there's no food, prices of uh, commodities are going high. And we know the cause. The cause is insecurity. Farmers cannot access their farm. What is the government doing to say that farmers have access to their farms? Now, on that issue, let's just refer to the Daily Trust newspaper, today's edition. As much as the government is looking to make concerted efforts through the National Assembly, there have been debates on the floor of the National Assembly in the Red Chambers and in the Green Chambers on the need for uh, an anti-open grazing bill and, uh, of course, the ranching system in Nigeria. But this morning, the Daily Trust uh, tells us that some headers under the association of Magban are rejecting that. They prefer a livestock ministry. That's the lead story on the Daily Trust. Let's look at that paper together for perspective. 
Now, on the Daily Trust, you find that story beneath the masthead. Headers reject Senate's bill on ranching. Straplines read, It is ill-conceived, says Macban. Livestock Ministry, best solution. Then on the rider, you have the sad story of bandits killing nine, abducting 15 Castina. If you see the prominent story on the Daily Trust, too, is a video we shared with you earlier. We shared again all security issues and challenges. An aged man arrested by the operatives of the NDLEA in the FCT with uh, over 499 compressed blocks of cannabis, weighing a total of 340.8 kg, loaded in a fake security vehicle. So we'll talk about all this in perspectives, but let's start with the headers rejecting the Senate's bill on ranching. You'd also see a video coming in this morning mm -hmm. where cattle were on a farm eating maize that had taken the farmers a lot of hard work to plant. Uh, we'll have that video up in a bit, but let's get your thoughts as well. What do Magban, what do they mean by livestock ministry? Eh? So are they saying that if, there's a life, if a ministry like that is created, it will not uh, give room for ranching? I think we have gone past this level of... Uh, uh, talking about uh, headers, farmers issues, one will know the solution. The solution for me is ranching. So why are they against it? It's the way to go. When you look at the cattle, the way they move around with the cattle, the cattle is it because they are not humans. They they suffer a whole lot, you know, trekking from one part of the north to the south to the east and all that, all in looking for for green to graze. graze to graze. And I think ranching is the way to go. In the, in the Western world, that is what is uh, obtainable. Uh, let's look at that video as well while we look to expand our thoughts. Uh, cattle, uh, you know, destroying a plantation of maize. Uh, it was shared by a user on x.com. And it's one of the calls for which uh, you'd find Dr. Steve Okori this morning calling for ranching. Now, some of these cattle are not as healthy as the ones you find that in a ranching system. They are more prone to diseases. Exactly. And with the conflicts that arise from such behavior it, mm. it has led to a huge number of deaths in nigeria you, you think about how much time it has taken these farmers to obtain fertilizers mm -hmm. cultivate the land mm -hmm. seedlings there's cassava there exactly. and then you find cattle let loose into the farms to destroy such crop the question i want to pose to the mark ban officials or whoever that are rejecting the ranching uh, bill now if they watch this video and they are the owners of this farm let us put them at the other side now let them be the farmers and uh, let uh, the, uh, the farmers now be headers with these cattle, eating their crops. How would they feel? So this is enough to cause crisis. Seriously. Because you cannot bring your, your cattle to my farm. Just the way you said, hired, bought uh, uh, farm uh, implements, uh, fertilizers and all that. And I farm my pr crops like this. At the end of the day, cattle will just come from nowhere and eat them up. And you expect I should keep quiet. And you see, when they come like that, they come prepared. They, they hate us. In the event when you want to attack them for eating your, your, your uh, crops, they also come out with their own uh, machete and whatever they have to attack you back. You know? So I think ranching is the way to go. Whatever Mark Bambas are saying, I don't think they mean well for the country because these issues have claimed lives of both Fulanese and also farmers. You know? So what are we saying? You have your own type of farming that you do. I have my own type. So why would you come always destroy my own? So ranching is the way. I don't know what they are talking about. And if it the ranch, it will make the cattle more productive. You know, a cattle that moves from one part of the country to another part. At the end of the day, if you want to uh, take out the milk from the female ones, for instance, the, the number of liters that you get from the one that has trekked so long and the ones that has kept in a the, in the particular the location, you see that the more the more liters of milk that they get, and it will be more healthy from the ones that is kept in the ranch. So what are we saying? Even in, in affording the cattle veterinary attendance. Exactly. So you, you have them in one location. In the event where one is sick, or the veterinary doctors can come treat them. So I think they need to be orientated. I think they, I think they need to teach them. Let them know. Is it because they are nomadic? They are used to trekking. They are not used to staying in one place. But that uh, that system can change. Now, the challenge now is unlike the urban areas with the examples we saw where we talked about the NSCDC and police, in communities where these issues happen, mm. the proximity between the nearest police station and some of the farmlands where these incidences happen 
a quite a number of kilometers and that is why even in response time exactly. there's very long time before responses are made in terms of alerts as raised when there's conflict mm -hmm. is there a way that uh, intelligence gathering and a community watch approach can also profess some solutions in this regard why not what is intelligence gathering and what is the community just the way i said Oh, everybody is a security manager, be it uh, the ones in uniform and the ones without uniform. We're all security managers. Now, a society or a community that has these uh, bodies of young boys put together, when they see such, uh, they, it, 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 it doesn't necessarily mean that they must attack. You know, there's a way you talk to the headers. Let them take their cattle off somebody's farmland. You know, that can be done. But a situation where they come and these headers see that uh, there's nobody to confront them, either by approaching them to talk to them in a soft manner or another, they will go ahead and do whatever they want to do. Their own business is that their cattle uh, eat whatever they see and they, and they get away. Now, another thing that is also a challenge to this uh, issue of uh, farmers and headers clash is that uh, there's the population explosion that we have. You know, gone are the days when there used to be a grazing route from up north down to the east south. When they come, they go like that. At the end of the day, they still return through that route. Now, population explosion has uh, uh, infringed on these grazing routes. You know, people have built houses on these grazing routes. People have farmed on these grazing routes and all that. So when they come like that, on that same route, and they, they, com they get confronted with obstacles of other buildings, or they don't have any option. So since population explosion has taken over all that, for me, ranching. So that we can continue to see ourselves in these uh, situations of uh, uh, farmers and headers conflict. If you go to Benin now, you have about two million is in the papers. Two million uh, IDPs, internally displaced persons. They have left their central homes or communities and kept in the camp as a result of this farmers headers uh, clash or conflict. So I don't think it's a it's a way to go based on what the Macban officials are saying. Ranching is the way to go. They should support the bill. Now, let's revisit the front page of the Daily Trust, where we find that story in terms of headers rejecting the Senate's bill on ranching, while Mark Ban is saying that he would rather opt for what they call a livestock ministry. Now, beneath that story, you now find this picture of the aged man who has been apprehended by the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency with uh, over 454 compressed blocks of cannabis sativa, weighing over 340.8 kg concealed in a fake security vehicle in Abuja. But we do have the video as well. Uh, the video would roll and it's quite shocking. Uh, we must also give kudos to the NDLEA for spotting that vehicle. It was said that the man here was blowing a siren uh, while moving around uh, Abuja and uh, he was apprehended. It, it, it's on the, the, the correlation between illicit drugs and criminality as, mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You know, just the way you said, kudos to the NDLA. We used to see NDLA in the past under different chairmen, but the NDLA under the current uh, uh, chairman, uh, Brigadier General Buba Marwa, of course, you have done tremendously well in, in terms of uh, what he's saddled with the responsibility of doing. And uh, also kudos to the men and the officers of the Nigerian uh, NDLA. They are doing very well. This arrest is a result of uh, intelligence gathering. You know, the, the NGLA are not ghosts to see where these things were packed in this vehicle. Ordinarily, the man has beaten a lot of police checkpoints and all that for him to be apprehended or arrested at this point. So, uh, the NGLA uh, response to the intelligence was swift, you know. Otherwise, the man would have gone to, to his uh, destination or wherever he was headed to. So. I think when we have uh, our other law enforcement agencies uh, doing the way the NDLA is currently doing, I think we will get results at the end of the day. Uh, it's a good thing there's need for synergy among the uh, security agencies, synergy, collaboration, cooperation, you know, so that let us see that they are working together, you know. If they don't work together, you don't expect results to come. You know, it's not a, an issue where a, a security agency wants to take the glory. You know, I, I think their objective is one, is to see that Nigeria is protected. Citizens are also protected. Uh, acts of criminalities like this are also seen to be taken care of. 
I guess people that uh, have intention or people that are already in it, you know, for them to be arrested and prosecuted according to the laws of our land. Now, in the NDLEA, the FCT command has apprehended a 76-year-old man who was the driver of that truck, which you saw. Uh, it's quite sad in this development in terms of how crime and criminality with the peddling of illicit substance is also being peddled towards criminality and crime in our country. Now, this is some correlations with uh, Mr. Francis or Mofa, who was the 76-year-old grandfather linked with the consignment, who was arrested. Well, it was intercepted on Tuesday, the 18th of June, but, uh, in a white Nissan Frontier pickup with amber lights and a fake registration number of a security agency at the Kii village in Kuje area of FCT. And we're told that 454 compressed blocks of cannabis sativa weighing 340.8 kg, which was procured from Edo State, was uh, discovered. Now, it's a drug ring that has been traced back to Edo State and is said to have gone on for over a decade. Can you imagine? It is also has names mentioned in a setting OB Ferguson, aged 45, NS Abonum, aged 46, who were also arrested in Edo State, where 209 kg of cannabis sativa was also recovered. Now, this drug ring, imagine the arrest was made here in Abuja Andrew. and traced all the while back to Edo State where they, they, they said the giant's ring mm -hmm. was, was, was formed over 10 years ago. I, I remember some time ago I traveled to Ekoma from Lokoja to Ekoma. I think I met roughly about um, 20 police checkpoints, 20. So imagine this trip from Edo down to Abuja. It means that the police officers and whoever that were on the road, there is customs also on the road, you know, they compromised. Either that they failed in checking, you know, which of course is a failure. You can't see a truck like this with goods having those contents and you won't check. Because you just see a police siren. Yes, in, you in just the vehicle. exactly. You just assume. What will just assume? So it means that either they compromised or they failed in their responsibilities as, pro as professionals. Why are they trained? It's not. I've seen in Nigeria, in Nigeria here where a, an ambulance with a casket was traveling, and they got to a point where uh, police officers insisted that they must open the casket. You know. There, must, there, there will be something from your training. There's something that you will see. I was trained also uh, to uh, uh, understand body language, which of course, if I see somebody and I see that the person is jittery or something, you know, from the person's facial ex uh, expression, also, you will just begin to suspect something. And I think those ones were, they took their training seriously and they asked that they open the casket. Lo and behold, guns and ammunition in the casket. Meanwhile, it has passed other checkpoints and they assume that it was carrying the cops, you know. So these are the things. We must be seeing that our law enforcement agents, once they are deployed on the road or anywhere they've been deployed to go and carry out the mandates or the services that they're supposed to render, they should do it professionally. They should not be carried away with uh, certain things that will, uh, that will distract them from the job that they've been salaried to do, you know. So for this man to drive all the way from Edo to Abuja is a failure on the part of the law enforcement agents that we have on the road. Now, it's a, a very serious development in Nigeria. There are broad angles to it. We've looked at the most recent incidents that has caused a lot of concern with the demise of the late Army Brigadier General Arnold Udokwere in his residence in Lokogoma uh, following an encounter with armed robbers. We've also looked at the situation where a tax force officer in Lagos was killed by a group of motorcycle riders. We also looked at some of the activities of the NDLEA commendably uh, with the arrest of a 76-year-old grandfather with uh, over 554 packs of compressed cannabis sativa weighing 340.8 kilograms who was apprehended in Abuja. We're also looking at the issue of the need for a ranching system in Nigeria to quell farmer headers clashes while Macban says they prefer a livestock ministry. It's a question on what that would entail and would it not have a ranching system in place? 
Uh, it's also on the angle of illicit substance and criminalities. We have a security consultant in the studio this morning. We also invite you to join the conversation and lend your thoughts, comments, and opinions. But before we come back to wrap up on the highlights of today's conversa conversation, which is the Office of the Citizens in terms of information gathering, which doctor says needs to be protest, uh, processed and analyzed to become intelligence. And in the angle of community watch, with the need for state police also gaining momentum. That will be our concluding segment when we come back from this next break. Stay with us. Well, thanks for staying with us as we come to the tail end of our conversation on our flagship program this morning. We've been discussing the broad topic of security, intelligence gathering, and a community watch approach. Now, whilst a lot of our reactions to crime in our society is from the reactive angle and rather than the proactive or preventive measure, we have with us here in the studio a fellow of the Nigerian Army Resource Center and a security consultant, Dr. Steve O'Quarry, who has uh, touched on sensitive issues in re reactions to certain incidences that have happened in recent time. But as we look to conclude, it is from the angle of the need to institute state police. Now, it's a conversation that uh, stemmed off the back of the last national dialogue yeah. on security convened a couple of months ago. Uh, whilst a lot of debates are on pro state police some are against the motion with the fear that uh, the sub regionals in terms of the governors might use up the intentions of constituting a state police how do you view this conversation you know when i appear on a forum like this i i look out for solutions to our security challenges because um, solutions for me is a way to go once this crime can be prevented then i think uh, it's it's a step in the right direction. Uh, state police, yes, is a welcome development for me. But I think that there are certain key things that we need to look at when we're talking about state police. It's not for us to be in a hurry to go copy from the US and other uh, Western countries. Yes, I recall that um, state police in, in state uh, Pennsylvania started in 1945, you know. So look at how far, the other state police. Uh, and for me, state police in the U.S., they don't have uh, intoxicated leaders with, with power that try to command and uh, control, uh, you know, everything and begin to look at uh, either opponents or perceived political opponents or critics, and they begin to see how to victimize them with uh, the use of state police. I think that can be applied here if we allow state police to to happen. But I am not against state police. But the question I want to put to uh, people or critical stakeholders that are asking for state police is that do we have states that are viable enough that can uh, uh, have state police, provide them with, uh, it's not just state police. Establishing state police is not the issue for me. It's sustenance is one. When you establish state police, it's not, it's not a something that you get to a point, maybe after three, four years, five years, ten years, and you, ca you see that you cannot continue with it. One now begins to happen. You establish state police, yes. You have to provide them with everything that they need to work with. You know, equipment, gadgets, arms. I, I'm pretty sure that they need to be armed. State police need Very to be true. Armed. Yes, because if they're not armed, then they are just there. They, there's a limit to how much they can enforce. Exactly. So all that needs to be provided by the state. Do we have states that are viable? When we have situations where even the federal government are still contending with uh, uh, these basic things that our law enforcement needs to work with, do we have states that are viable to provide all that when they establish state police? Do we have states that are viable enough to pay salaries to these state police officers when they are recruited? We see states owing civil servants two, three years, four years. Now you want to come and arm state police officers? And without paying them salaries at the end of the day and their allowances to get them committed to what they are saddled with the responsibility to come and do. So these are the issues. It's not about creating or establishing state police. A whole lot needs to go down. They need to sit down and look at it. How many states? Yes, Lagos can be viable. Kano, Rivers, and the other states can be viable from what we are seeing. But Taraba and some other states that we see, that we have, Benue, and do they have what it takes to sustain such a structure? You know? So I, I think that a whole lot needs to be taken into consideration. The conversation should, they should enlarge the scope, you know, 
and see how they can establish it, sustain it. You know, just the way I said, you must have to provide the basic things, the logistics, everything. And it should be seen that our intoxicated governors should not use them as tools against critics of their government. We see what is happening. In Benue, there's no peace. Politically, there's no peace. In Rivers, there's no peace. And we see all this. In Kano as well. In Kano as well. So imagine that you have state police under the command of governors. And imagine the orders that they will give to these uh, state police officers. Imagine the crisis. Now, uh, in Rivers, the federal police, the IGP has, the IGP ordered the federal police to, to barricade all the 23 local governments in Rivers just to see how to avoid the uh, crisis from uh, opponents and uh, the other group of persons that are fighting against each other in the same political party. So imagine that there's a state police and the governor gives his own order to the state police to go to the local governments that have been closed down or barricaded by the federal police. Imagine the conflict that will arise from there. So these are the things that we need to look at. So for now, my own opinion as a professional, let the security agencies be under the leadership of the federal government and let us see how we can take it up from there. But for now, I don't think Nigeria is right considering this, some of these uh, factors that I've raised for state, for police. state police. Now, whilst we wait for the country to ripen in your perspective, there's also conversations for a change in nomenclature. Mm. People are saying the force in the Nigerian police force should be replaced with service. Does this connotation have any symbolism? Well, of what difference will we make? Will it change their manners of uh, uh, approach to their duties? 